praise God. You can make your way back to your seats. Remain standing. Can we clap our hands for this wonderful worship team? And haven't they done a phenomenal job leading us into the presence of God? And uh, God is doing a marvelous work in this week. And hasn't the youth team, the youth committee, haven't they done a marvelous job putting on this convention? Amen. I know a lot of preparation, a lot of hours uh, that have gone into making this possible. Uh, so all the sound and media, thank you for your hard work and using your gifts to help the kingdom. And uh, it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, I tell you what, Feel like God has broken some chains this week, and uh, I tell you what, eleven o'clock this morning felt like seven o'clock this morning. It's like whoa, it is eleven o'clock already. It was crazy. How late did y'all stay up last night? Who got to sleep at? Raise your hand if you got to sleep at three this morning. Raise your hand if you got to sleep at 4 this morning. Raise your hand if you got to sleep at 5 this morning. Raise your hand if you got to sleep at 6 this morning. There's hands up. Raise your hand if you got to sleep at 7 this morning. Oh, there's hands up. Raise your hand if you got to sleep at 8 this morning. There's one hand up. There's, two, there's three hands up. If you got to sleep at 9, raise your hand. There's a, y'all, I'm going to have to take a bow to you. That's just, that's incredible. Nine, who didn't go to sleep? Raise a hand if you didn't go to sleep. One hand all the way in the back. We got a trooper, so I'm going to try to keep this short, amen. And to keep you up, I might use you as an illustration or something, so. <laughs> but, uh. Thank you guys for your kindness and hospitality this week. I uh, feel like God has spoken this week and uh, I heard the sessions were just amazing yesterday. How many of y'all were blessed by the sessions that happened yesterday and all the speakers? been such an honor to be uh, teamed with every one of them. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 2. I didn't get to my first point last night. <laughs> Amen. Y you know what it is? You know, I tried to preach it the first night. The Lord switched it up. I tried to preach it last night. The Lord said no. And so he's like, you know what? Why don't you just teach it? Hey, Amen. So I'm gonna uh, gonna take my time uh, this morning and get this word to you, and uh, pray it's a blessing, and we'll see what the Lord does. He's in charge, right? And He makes all things well. Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. When she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch put the child therein and she laid it in the reeds by the river's brink 
The sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the riverside. When she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go, and the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. Verse 10, last scripture. And the child grew, she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, Because I drew him out of the water. I'm going to talk about that moment that she laid Moses in the reeds. And again, I'm going to attempt to teach and talk to you on that subject, the ministry of the reeds. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Can you just clap your hands as you're being seated? I love having the opportunity to really just break down uh, a text and a thought um, because I believe that teaching is incredibly important. I believe that the power of God and the importation of God's spirit is so important. And I believe to be rooted and grounded, I believe it's good to have sessions like this to just take time and dig it out. The ministry of the reeds. I told you last night that I see Moses' ministry starting right there when he is laid among the reeds. Before he has any cognitive ability, before he ever preaches a message, before he ever writes anything down, I see his ministry starting right there while he is abandoned and helpless and feeling neglected right there among the reeds. I, I see his ministry starting here because when the Bible says she laid the child in the reeds. Notice it didn't say that she laid the child in the river. A lot of people think that somehow she put Moses into this ark and sent him off to the river like Moses just floating like, hey, this is so cool. No, she didn't do that. She laid it in the reeds alongside the river. That's important because the reeds was where the crocodiles nested. But she understood that her deliverance was in a dangerous place. She said, either God's going to get them or the crocodile's going to get them. But whatever I got to do, I got to get this thing out of me. She said, either God's going to get them or the crocodile's going to get them, but I know that I can't hold on to it anymore. I've got to do something with it. Can I tell you to get delivered, it's going to be a little dangerous. It's going to be a little risky. Come on, somebody. You can't play it safe and get delivered. You've got to step out of your comfort zone, and I know that clapping is uncomfortable, but sometimes you got to take a risk. I know shouting is uncomfortable, but sometimes you got to take a risk. I know being used by God is uncomfortable, but sometimes you got to take a risk. She, she understood that for me to, for, for the child to be delivered to where God wanted him to be, she had to release it into a dangerous place where the crocodiles nested. And she said, 
if I hold on to him, he's in more danger, me holding on to him, than to just release him and trust God. See, see, it's more dangerous to hold on to your gift than it is to release your gift. See, some of y'all can sing, but you don't want anybody to know you can sing. You be singing at home. I wish I could practice singing, but I, I don't want y'all to run. Amen. Y'all, y'all be singing at home. Y'all be like, hey, hey, hey. I can do that for like two seconds. The third seconds, I crash and burn. I can just make it like, hold on, can he sing? Can he not sing? I just, I can't, but I do it for two seconds, and it's like, it's like the Lord anoints me for two seconds, then it's over, amen. (laughs) You sing so well at home, but you get to church. You make sure nobody can hear you can sing because you, you're afraid they might call you up to volunteer to sing for youth night. And, 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 and you wonder why you have frustration and you wonder why you feel a little anxious. It's because you are hiding something that God wants to use for his kingdom, but you're afraid to be used because you don't want to fail. Because you don't want to get among the crocodiles. Come on, somebody. And the crocodiles start snapping at you because you got a target on your back because you're being used. But it's more dangerous to hide your gift than it takes to release it. Come on, somebody. You've got to trust that God's not going to let the crocodile get you. you got to trust that God is going to protect you. And he's going to give you an anointing. And he's going to give you a deliverance. Listen to, listen to this. The, the, the man with one talent, he hid his talent because of fear, because of a misperception of his master, and because of an intimidation by other, everyone else's talent. So you think, well, they sing so good, they don't need my voice. But the problem is that the master holds you accountable to what he gave you. So the one with one talent, because of fear, because of a misperception of his master, and because intimidation by others' talents, he hides his gift. Listen, he gets a shovel. He digs a hole. Listen, he buries the gift. He buries it, goes out. The master comes back and says, where's, where's the talent I gave you? He has to go back and find the hole. He has to un, undig the gift, has to get it out again, close the hole back. What am I saying? It takes more energy to hide your gift than it takes to invest in it. God said, look, I wish you would have at least invested in it. Come on. God's not asking you to do something special with it. He's just saying, can you invest in it? It takes more sweat, blood, and tears to hide it than it takes to invest in it. You've got to take a risk and invest in what God has given you. You've got to take a risk and invest. You know, some people think, some people think, well, well, if I try to hide that, that I'm, I'm, I'm talented, if I, if I can just hide it, maybe the devil won't get me. I'm just, I'm not going to, I don't want to be too anointed, the devil might get me. Can, can I, can I t- the, the devil has been after you since the moment you took your first breath on earth. So you know what? You might as well fight back with what God gave you. Mm. Okay. Um, So she takes a risk and she puts it among the reeds. The reeds is where the crocodiles nested. 
And that is very interesting that she put her possession in a dangerous place. Now, this is very interesting because, remember, they were throwing those men child, they were killing those childs and they, those children, and they were throwing them to the crocodiles in the river. But she places them in an ark alongside the river and a, at the river's brink among the reeds. And when Moses survived the presence and the danger of crocodiles, God gave him dominion over that spirit. Because I want you to know something, because now we're teaching. See, I wouldn't have had time to give this to you this week, but now we're teaching, so we're going to go deep. You ready to go deep? Here it is. Remember later in Moses' ministry, God puts a staff in his hand. Right? He has a staff in his hand, right? God said, throw the staff down. And when he threw the staff down, remember, it became a serpent. Remember that? It became a serpent. And then later when he goes into Pharaoh's court, he has the staff in his hand. They throw the staff down, and the Bible says it became a serpent, right? But if you notice, when the first time he threw it down and it became a serpent, the Hebrew word is nakash, which means snake. It's the same word in Genesis 3 with the serpent in the garden. Nakash, snake. But when he goes in Pharaoh's court and he throws it down again, him and Aaron, when they throw the staff down again, it says serpent, but the Hebrew word is not nakash. It's tenin. And tenin means sea monster. Modern translation, modern Hebrew calls it crocodile. When Moses threw his staff down in Pharaoh's court, it did not become a snake. It became a crocodile. And they worshipped the crocodile god. I'm about to preach in this place now. They worship the crocodile god Sobek, listen, and they love the crocodile god so much that they would put crocodiles in Pharaoh's court and the magicians would bring them out uh, for fun. They love the crocodile's aggression. They love the crocodile so much they would mummify the crocodile. Why? Because they believed that the crocodile god, that he died, he was buried, and he rose again. But here God comes right into Pharaoh's court. Moses throws down its staff and it becomes a crocodile. And what Moses was saying was, what I've been through, I've got dominion over. And I've got a God that is greater than your crocodile. And Pharaoh's magicians, they released the crocodiles to try to fight against Moses' crocodile. But Moses' crocodile ate up both of their crocodiles. And what God was saying was, I am greater than all of your false gods. I am more powerful than all of your false gods. I am one God. All of Exodus was God putting judgment on Egypt's false gods. I want you to look that up when you get home. Everybody say tenen. I want you to look that up when you get home. A crocodile. Became a crocodile. Every, all of Exodus was God ju putting judgment on Egypt's false gods. When he darken the sun. That was God putting judgment on Egypt's false god, the sun god, Ra. When God caused frogs to come out of the river, that was God putting judgment on Egypt's false god, Hajet, the frog god. And what God was showing them was, none of your gods are real. There's only one God, and he is greater than any god you can try to create. And so it becomes a crocodile. And what Moses has been through now, he has dominion over it. And what hell tried to destroy him with, now he uses it as a weapon to destroy hell. 
where Goliath tried to destroy David with the sword. Come on, somebody. It became the sword that would destroy Goliath. What hell tried to kill you with, God will put it in your hand to kill hell with. So, so, so hell tried to destroy you with depression, huh? but now you can walk into a convention huh? and you've survived the depression. Now you've got dominion over it. Huh? And now you see other young people battling with depression like you used to. Huh? And you're able to walk over there with authority huh? and say, in the name of Jesus, huh? I speak the joy of the Lord. Huh? I speak the power of God. And that is cast out because you've got dominion over it now. You used to battle fear. You used to be in a spirit of fear. Now you go to church and you can see when somebody is being taken down and paralyzed by fear. And when you see them, you've got dominion over it now. And you're able to walk in the power of God and speak perfect love. And all of a sudden, you watch the chains break off of them like it used to break off of you because you've got dominion over it. Now you've got a sword in your hand. Come on. After you survive the attack, God puts a sword in your hand. After you survive the affliction, God puts a sword in your hand. He has dominion over it. I see Moses' ministry starting among the reeds. Because I, I see, listen, among the reeds, I see that Moses would spend his whole life among the reeds. His whole life until he died would be spent among these reeds. That's why I see his ministry. Because these reeds were what they would use they would break off these reeds, listen. They would break open the inner bark of these reeds, listen. They would lay it down flat and it would become papyrus. That's where you get the word paper. The earliest writings in the world came from these reeds. Papyrus. The earliest writings came from these reeds in the Nile River. Listen, if you wanted to write during this day, you had to make a journey to the Nile River and start picking up these reeds. The most popular place in the world and the most prominent place to get paper was these reeds. The earliest writings from the Grecians the philosophers, they had to make a trip to the Nile River and break off these reeds to write. The Romans, they love visiting the Nile because to write their laws, the Roman law, they had to go to the Nile River and break off these reeds, break open the inner bark. And that's where you get the word papyrus, paper. That's where we get our English word paper, papyrus. Two words for these reeds. The Greek words, papyrus and biblos. That's where you get the word Bible. Bible just means the books. The books that are made of papyrus. But to write, you had to go to the Nile. So, it looks like happenstance that he's laid among the reeds, but it's not. It's strategic. It is the sovereignty of God because God would inspire Moses to be the first writer, to write the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers. God inspired Moses to write. But in order to write, he had to go back to his experience. 
Listen, listen, listen. Oh, Lord. So, so, so he had to go back to his experience to write. And so listen, so he would write like this. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hero Israel, the Lord. Go back to my read experience and go get me another writing. Because I can't finish until I go back and visit my experience, I come to preach to somebody. Out of every wound you have been through comes a writing. Out of every pain that you have come through comes a writing. You didn't go through what you went through for nothing. There's a writing coming out of this. There's a book coming out of this. There's a purpose. Out of every wound, out of every wound comes a writing. In order for him to complete the book, the inspired word of God, he had to keep on sending people back to his experience. He had to bring them back to the time he felt abandoned, with the time he felt rejected, with the time he felt helpless. And out of the helplessness, there was a word that would come out of it. There was a writing that would come out of it. Everything that has happened in your life, God has not left you nor has he forsaken you. He's going to use all of that pain. He's going to use all of that hurt and he's going to use it to write a new chapter. He's going to write a new, come on somebody and where you thought you were hopeless, God's going to write hope and where you thought you were broken, God's going to write bless. There's a writing coming out of it. It looks, it looks like it's happenstance, but, but, it, but, but God strategically had her place him among the reeds because he would keep on visiting there and to write out of it. Oh, Lord in heaven, he would continue to go there to get more writings. He kept on reaping more writings out of his pain, out of his hurt, out of his darkness, out of the things that he didn't know what was going on in his world uh, that became almost a lifeline uh, of the faithfulness of God. Uh, somewhere you're going to look back on your life uh, even if you were raised in an abusive household uh, even if you were raised with people that don't like you uh, even if you've been a foster child uh, even if you've been misunderstood by your mommy and daddy uh, somewhere along the line uh, God's going to write something over you uh, oh God is writing something over your life uh, and you're going to reap out of that experience uh, to help more people than you can imagine. Uh, there's a turnaround coming out of this. Uh, there's an anointing coming out of this. Uh, there's something supernatural coming out of this. Uh, there's a writing coming out of the wound. In order for him to complete the book, he had to keep going back to his experience. It's very possible that the ark that he was in was laid among the reeds. He's nestled up against reeds that he would later write the word of God on. And where he didn't think God was there. Come on. Oh Lord. Have you ever looked back over your life when you felt like God wasn't there and all of a sudden you see, hold on, God was setting me up the whole time. Those places in your life where you feel like things have been out of control. I want you to think about Adam. God puts Adam in a deep sleep and makes, takes his rib, makes a woman out of the rib. Listen, God did more in Adam's life when Adam didn't know what was going on. God did more in Adam's life when things were out of his control. 
than when Adam had control. Come on, somebody. And God is doing more in your life. You don't know what's been going on in your life the past two years. But can I tell you, God's writing a masterpiece behind the scenes. God's beginning to set some things up. God has a new chapter for you in your life. You're never going to walk the same. You're never going to talk the same. You're never going to do the same things. Because there's a book that's coming out of this. Biblos. Biblos. The Bible. God could not change the world from heaven. God had to become human. What did it say? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The Hebrew writer said that he, Jesus Christ, that he came in the volume of a book. He had to become a writing. And the Bible has been written with his blood. He sealed that book with his blood. Come on, somebody. He, he did a lot for us from heaven, but he couldn't save us unless he went through an experience. And Thomas, Thomas doubted his resurrection. He said, I will not believe him until I see his wounds. So I won't believe he's resurrected until I see his scars. He says, the resurrection isn't persuading me, but the wound does. Because it's the wound that gives God relatability. Oh, Lord. See, he couldn't relate to us from heaven because he never cried. He couldn't relate to us from heaven because he never lost anybody. He was unrelatable, but when he became a word, all of a sudden, he was touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He wept like we wept. He was betrayed like we were betrayed. And he did more for us as a book, as a word. There's a writing. There's a writing coming out of the wound. Moses had no idea that his childhood was preparation for a lifetime of ministry. I want you to think about this with me. Wave a hand if I'm helping somebody. Don't you love the word of God? L listen to this. Look how, look how, I'm going to show you how a massive fool your God is, okay? Oh, man, I'm about to run in this place, okay? Help me. L listen to this. God said, okay, my people need deliverance. So here's how I'm going to deliver them. Here it is. I I'm going to raise their deliverer in the enemy's house. I want Moses to be raised by Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is going to teach him battle strategies. Because I'm preparing him to possess the land. Oh, you're, you're not hearing me yet. You're not hearing me yet. He's raised in the enemy's house, and Pharaoh is teaching him how to do warfare. He is teaching him how to have army strategies, and God was preparing them for when they go into the promised land to defeat the enemy to, to, and conquer the land of Canaan for the name of God. I'm trying to tell you, no matter how you were raised, God is been using it for training. God's been using it to push you to another level. God's been using it. (laughs) 
raises a baby in the enemy's house. And the system that raised him gave him, equipped them, equipped him by how to destroy him, destroy them. The system that raised him equipped him on how to destroy the system that raised him. Everything that the devil means for evil, God knows how to turn it around for good. I, I think about I think about how I, I, I you've heard my story. I've, I've said it a little bit on the first night. I think about how I was raised in an abusive household. And I had a stepdad that used to beat me every day. I'd have black eyes, busted lips, and uh, I'd go to school bleeding. And that was just my life. The trauma was so bad, I could not speak a word of English intelligibly for the first five years of my life. My Mom had to send me to a speech therapist in kindergarten for a year to teach me how to speak because I still babbled as a baby at five years old. And what's interesting about that is that my mom told me at three years old, she said, I'll never forget. She said, you be on your grandma's porch. And she said, I'll never forget. It just happened one time. She said, you picked up a stick off the ground. She said, and you put that stick up to your mouth. And she said, you started swaying side to side. And she said, the only word that we understood that you said was Jesus, 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 acting like you were preaching. I wasn't raised in church, but somehow in the abuse, God said, I still have my hand up. And if God had his hand upon me, how much more has he had his hand upon you? Amen, amen, you may be seated. And where it seemed like the devil was winning. Listen, at five years old, I went to a speech therapist that taught me how to speak. Uh, I know it's not noticeable because I, I don't have a Louisiana accent. I was born and raised in Louisiana for 18 years of my life. I never got a Louisiana accent. My mom and my three sisters, they all have a strong Louisiana accent. I never got it. When I went to school, they said, where are you from? I said, well, I'm from here. I go back to Louisiana. Where are you from? Well, I'm from here. But somehow how uh, in the speech therapy uh, it was training me for ministry y'all not hearing me right now uh, somehow in the middle of the abuse that was trying to destroy me uh, the abuse somehow pushed me to get a fascination for words uh, pushed me to get a fascination uh, for uh, not knowing that I would be a preacher come on somebody and the very thing that tried to kill me God used it to prepare And that speech therapy that gave me, helped me gain a fascination for words. How could I have known that some of the principles from that speech therapy would be the very principles that I would draw from when God told me he wanted me to learn Spanish? And now I'm able to speak Spanish and English preach in Spanish and preach in English from what I learned in speech therapy after surviving abuse. God will give you back double. I said, you're not just going to be anointed. You're going to change your city. You're not just going to be anointed. You're going to change your community. You're, come on, so God's going to give you back double for what you survived. 
Okay. Okay. Is this still helping somebody? I, uh, he has no idea that the helplessness and the abandonment and the things that he's going through now, that there would be writings that would come out of it. Out of every wound comes a writing. Out of every wound comes a word. This is interesting to me because he would spend his whole life writing on reeds. Watch this. But he would also help deliver, listen, three million people at least, estimated, through the Red Sea. And the Red Sea, everyone say Red Sea. The Red Sea is literally translated in Hebrew is the Sea of Reeds. It makes sense now why he had to go through it. Oh, God. He had to have his own Reed experience. Because he would later help three million people survive their read experience. You didn't just go through it for you. You went through it for your family. You went through it for your school. You went through it for your community. It wasn't just about you. It was about a lot of people. In English, when they translated it uh, in Hebrew, it's Sea of Reeds. Uh, when they translated it to English, they said they called it the Red Sea. Uh, but it's the Sea of Reeds. Uh, he had no idea with all the pain that he was dealing with in his early life. Uh, he had no idea uh, that God was preparing him uh, to help a bunch of people uh, that felt abandoned, uh, that felt helpless, uh, that felt forsaken. Uh, and he would walk with them to help them survive their own read experience and he said hold on let me tell you how I made it through I made it through by trusting in God come on we're gonna make it out of this thing if I survived it you can survive it if you look at Victor Jackson's life and say how did he survive it can I tell you if I survived it you're gonna survive it if your pastor survived it you're gonna survive it you're gonna come out of this better Oh, somebody clap your hands to the Lord right now. He had to go through his read experience, listen, so he would always be a relatable leader. And he can lead them through it. Because he himself had already been through it. You are being prepared for leadership. You are being qualified by your affliction. You are being prepared by your pain. You are being heightened by your hurt. Everything that you have been going through has been preparation. He had no idea that there would be three million people waiting on him, hoping that he doesn't give up in his read experience. Because if you give up in your read experience, I never get delivered from my read experience. 
And if you give up because of a season of depression, there's thousands of others that won't be delivered because you gave up. thousands of others that won't be set free from anxiety because you gave up in yours. But if you learn to hold on to God when you're going through those experiences, you're going to give hope to others that are going through it. And they're going to look to you as an example. Come on, somebody. They're going to look to you as an example. If they can come out of it better, I know that I can come out of it better. It's only in Christianity that God can do such a work in your life, watch this, that you start thanking God for the pain that you went through. Only in Christianity, where you, where you start thanking God, I thank you that I went through it. Because it didn't feel good while I was in it. But when I look afterwards, I wouldn't have had the anointing that I had. I wouldn't have had the power that I have now. God can reverse it in such a way. And I hear the Lord speaking right now, saying, tell my people, do not get bitter over what they have been through. I'm, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something in the word of God. Joseph's brothers they ripped off his coat of many colors, right? Years later, he gets second in command to Pharaoh after through a series of process, a pit, a prison, and a palace. Now he gets promoted. Listen, and his brothers come. And when his brothers come, Joseph reveals his identity to his brothers. And look what Joseph does. The Bible says that Joseph gave all of his brothers, look what it says, he gave them many coats. Here's the message. You ripped my coat of many colors so later I could give you coats of many colors. There's not a bitter bone in my body. And he said, you didn't send me here. God sent me here to preserve your lives by a great deliverance. Come on. Okay. He would bring them through. A sea of reeds. This is the power. Everyone has to go through this for preparation for leadership. I want to I share this with you because the Apostle Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 3. He said, he said, I don't need to send you. Look what he says. And I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing exercise up here, huh? It's the only exercise I've done all year. I need to have one of those little Fitbit things on. Probably losing a lot of weight preaching, huh? Listen to this, guys. Um, the Apostle Paul said, he said, look, I don't need to s send you a letter of recommendation, of commendation. He said, I don't need to send you any epistle. Look what he said. 
You are my epistle. Watch this. Not written with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. There's something that happens when Moses brought his people through that read experience. The Bible says later that they were baptized unto Moses. They were baptized unto Moses, meaning that there is a spiritual relationship that happens between the sheep and their shepherd, between a pastor and his congregation. Because a pastor gets up to preach, and when he gets up to preach, and he preaches out of his read experience, preaching out of his pain, out of his wound, out of his hurt, you not knowing, him not knowing that you were about to give up, but all of a sudden, a pen from heaven comes down. And after you hear him preaching out of his read experience, there is a spiritual transmission that begins to happen because all of a sudden, you are about to give up. But when you hear that word from the pulpit and you lift up your hands, all of a sudden, from his read experience, it starts riding from heaven. A new story on your read experience. And you become an epistle. Where you try to write hopeless over your life, God starts writing hope. Okay, okay, okay. And there is a connection, there is a bond that happens between a pastor and his congregation because he doesn't know all that you have been through, but he got up in the Word and had no idea what you suffered through that week. But he began to preach and it began to resonate with your experience. And it's like God begins to heal the wound and, put, and he replaces the wound with a word. And now there's an, there's an attachment. Come on. Is that powerful? That, 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 that God uses your pastor's pain to help you get delivered. One of the toughest things about preaching, I'm about to give you some insight here. Are you ready for this? I'm about to give you some insight into ministry. One of the toughest things about preaching is having to live through what you just preached. You preach about the storm, then all of a sudden you look at the clouds. Uh oh. And I, and I love this about, about Jesus. Am I still helping somebody? I, I'm about to close it up real quick, okay? I just, I just love you guys, man. I just don't want to leave, you know? I just, just want to just hang out a little bit, praise God. <laughs> Amen. 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 I'm trying to find ways to make this message even longer. I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. I'm totally <laughs> I'm almost done. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, but, but listen to this, guys. Listen to this. We, we, when you go through it, when you, the shepherd goes through it, when you go through your pain, when you go through that, that affliction, there, there is a spiritual connection that happens between you and your leader because, because of what they survive is ministering to what you are surviving. And the Holy Ghost, when you receive the Holy Ghost, it is, the Bible says that God writes his law upon your heart. You are God's epistle. And he uses, but he had to go through the experience to produce the writing. Because the Holy Ghost couldn't be poured out until Jesus first died, was buried, rose again, ascended back into heaven. But there was a writing that came from heaven where you received the Holy Ghost. And when you speak in tongues, all of a sudden God just says, hey. There's a future. There's a destiny. There's an anointing. 
And I came to just close this message by saying, take the pen out of your hand. You tried to close the book on your life. You thought you were defined by your experiences, and you tried to close the book on your life. God said, take the pen out of your hand. That's why when you lift up your hands, you want to do it with open hands because you're saying, God, I put the pen down. I want your pen. Can you please write on my wound? <laughs> Nothing that you have been through has been wasted. You didn't go through it for nothing. Your trial was not in vain. There's hope that's coming out of this. I want you to stand on your feet. There's a ministry that's coming out of the reeds. I want everyone to just make your way forward. Musicians can come. We're going to have a time of prayer before we dismiss. That's it. There's a ministry that's coming out of these reeds. I know that there are people here that have been raised in church that have been through things that you could never tell anybody. I know that there are pastor's kids and kids with an incredible apostolic lineage that have been through things and your family has been through things that no one will ever, you'll never talk about. But what God has come to assure you this afternoon, that his eye has been upon your life, that he has seen every step and every misstep, that he has watched every tear that has fallen to the ground out of your read experience. And he is promising you by his spirit that there is a writing, there's a beautiful story that's going to come out of this, that's going to help more people than you can imagine. I wish I would have known the things that God had prepared for me while I was crying in the fetal position, wondering why my dad didn't love me. I wish I'd have known that God would use that to help me to minister to the fatherless. I wish I'd have known when I felt like a failure and nothing I could do was right to please him. I had perfectionist tendencies because if I wasn't perfect, I would be beaten. And I wish I'd have known while I'm locked up in my room and I'm locked in the closet and the family's out having fun, I wish I'd have known that God would use that abandonment to minister to those that feel abandoned. It could have helped me to deal with my trial better if I knew how many people God would use me to help. I am giving you this afternoon an insight into your future that what you are presently going through and what you have been through, God is going to use to deliver hundreds of and thousands and millions of people.
but here's what I need you to do. I just need you to take the pen out of your hand. Stop writing failure over your life. Stop writing damaged goods. Stop writing too many mistakes. And I want you to set that pen down and allow the creator of heaven to begin to write over every one of your lives. So here's what we're about to do. What we're about to do is we're about to pray over the person next to us in a moment. And let me tell you something. Your pain qualifies you to pray for that person next to you. Don't worry about, oh, I haven't prayed many hours today. I haven't, I haven't fasted long. I haven't, let me tell you, your pain qualifies you today to pray for that person next to you. Because let me tell you what's going to happen. You, when you start praying out of your read experience over the person next to you, you have no idea that they have been through some of the same things. And what you have been through and how you have overcome when you pray for them, they're going to reap deliverance. They're going to reap power out of what you survived. That's, that is why we need the entire body of Christ. Can I tell every young person this? You are valuable and you are needed in the body of Christ. And even if you feel weak, the Bible says that the feeble members of the body are necessary. Look what he said. He said, the weakest members in the body of Christ, look what he said. This is the Bible. He said, on them we ought to put the most honor on. That's Bible. So when you feel weak, you try to disqualify yourself saying, I'm not needed. But when God sees weakness, he says a place, I'm going to put my honor on you. Because you're still here in all of your weakness. You're still showing up. You're still pressing on. And you're still needed in the body. So I want you to join with someone near you right now. I want you to join with someone near you from the front to the back. I don't, I don't want anybody to be alone right now. Singers can come up. I don't want anybody to be alone right now. But right now, you're helping somebody to get through their read experience. You're helping somebody survive that depression, survive that abuse. Some of them are going back and they're being raised in the enemy's house. And you are giving them strength to press through the storm. You're giving them strength to press through the negativity. You're giving them strength to press through the hurt and the heartache. Your prayers are helping them to get delivered. Come on, I feel, I feel the love of God flooding this place. I feel the love of God flooding over somebody's wound right now. I see the pin of heaven beginning to come down and write a new story. I feel the pen of heaven beginning to come down and write over your life. The Spirit of God is beginning to write something anew in the name of Jesus Christ.